Hello and welcome everybody to the Soybean Innovation Lab's uh, Smallholder Mechanization in Africa webinar series. This is the fifth webinar in our series. All of the webinars are recorded and archived at the Soybean Innovation Lab website, which is at soybeaninnovationlab.illinois.edu. I have all the um, links listed here in this slide, but you can just go to our website and follow the uh, follow the prompts through the website and find each of the webinars. So to tell you a little bit about what's going to be happening today, our webinar format will start out with our presentation. During the presentation, you all can type questions in the question pane. There's a question pane, there's also a chat pane. So if anybody um, has an issue uh, during the webinar, you can you can type in the chat and we'll see it, or uh, if you have questions, please type them into the question pane. And you can type them as you think of the question. Then after the presentation, um, we will ask, we will, uh, I will read out the questions and the presenter can answer them. Uh, additionally, after the presentation, a short poll will be done. Um, then after the poll, we'll read out the questions and then have the answers. After the question and answer period, the webinar is going to end with a short survey so that we can get your all's opinions about um, what kind of research on mechanization you would like to see in Africa. Um, I would also like to remind everybody that there is going to be another Soybean Innovation Lab webinar next week, same time, same place, on the disease guide for soybeans in Africa. So now I would like to introduce our speaker for today. Uh, so Dr. Alan Hansen comes from South Africa where he had received his PhD in agriculture engineering from the University of Natal in South Africa. He is a professor of agricultural and biological engineering at the University of Illinois. He's also, oh, hang on while I try to clear my screen so I can see it. He's also the leader of the Appropriate Scale Mechanization Consortium with the Feed the Future Innovation Lab for Collaborative Research on Sustainable Intensification. Dr. Hansen, Dr. Hansen's research creates innovative solutions to improve the operation of off-road machines systems. He leads a U.S. team that has established innovation and field hubs in Bangladesh, Cambodia, Ethiopia, and Burkina Faso, and he had develops appropriate scale technologies to help smallholder farmers, especially women, to be more productive while benefiting the local environment and economic well-being of rural communities. So now I'm going to take just a minute to switch the screen over to Dr. Hansen. Uh, if you guys will be patient, I lost my... There we go. Okay. I'm going to switch now to Dr. Hansen. Okay. Is that working? Um, I think we need... Yes. Yes, we see you now. You're, you're ready to go. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you very much, Kerry. And uh, I also like to thank the uh, Soybean Innovation Lab for providing this opportunity to uh, make a presentation about our USAID funded uh, appropriate scale mechanization project. Um, I just wanted to say at the beginning that, uh, you know, while the focus of this webinar series is about improving mechanization for African smallholder farmers, we will be including some details of work that we've been doing in two developing countries in Asia as well because we see some value um, in terms of the, the linkages across the continents and the work being done in these other countries in Asia that might be of value and relevance for, the, for Africa as well. Um, I also want to emphasize right at the beginning that this is a team effort. There are a lot of people that have contributed to this work and I want to acknowledge that as well. Uh, you will notice that uh, Tim Rendell is listed there as one of the uh, sort of co-authors of this and uh, uh, Tim is the project manager and has played a big role, is playing a big role in this. So let's move on. Um, if I can. Okay, so what I plan to do is to talk about the, our experiences in implementing and evaluating uh, technologies in these, uh, in four developing countries, uh, give you some background to our consortium and how we've engaged with the countries and partners. And I think this could be of some value relative to maybe things that are happening in Africa uh, by other people. Um, and then a, a big part of it is, you know, how do we implement technologies? How do we evaluate them 
in an effective way, what factors should be considered, and I'll end off with some uh, final comments. So some background, which I'm sure um, the, the, the folks are, are very familiar with, the issue of, of undernourished people, that we have a large portion of our population, global population that are undernourished, uh, I think it's one in nine people, and of those undernourished uh, people, 98% are reside in, in developing countries um, based on FAO uh, statistics. And of course, with the increasing world population, you know, the whole issue of food production comes into being and the issues of undernourishment and that kind of thing. And we see, as you can see on the right hand side with the graph there, the expansion in all the, the different countries, including the, the less developed countries. So mechanization is seen as having a potentially a very big role to play and may be regarded as somewhat as being neglected actually in some countries. And in terms of Africa, uh, stats, statistics show that less than 10% of farming operations are performed with engine power and 25% of the power is provided by draft animals and over 70% is done by manual labor, mostly women um, the elderly and, and children, and, and we saw evidence of this in Ethiopia when we visited there. So how can mechanization play a role in this? Well obviously it can reduce the drudgery of the work, particularly by women, improve the quality of life, and you can see all these potential benefits that can come out of it. Increased productivity, uh, timeliness, reducing losses, um, increasing household incomes and so on. Uh, through the and then and a big part of it is the business development, which I will talk about some more later on. So how does how do we fit into the picture? So we uh, fall under the Sustainable Intensification Innovation Lab that's based at Kansas State University. So we are a consortium under that one of two, the other being a geospatial one, and then also you will see that there are our research sub awards, so to speak, that are involved in six different uh, developing countries. And then there are also uh, some groups that deal with the indicators framework and some small-scale irrigation. We got started in October 2015. It's a four-year project, and uh, so we have um, just uh, just over two years to go, I guess, until we are are done. <laughs> the the team um, we have four universities in the U.S. that are involved, and here you can see the the team members. I just wanted to show this relative to indicating or reflecting the, the scope of expertise that we have, which ranges from you know, basic engineering, ag agriculture mechanization, right through to economics, animal nutrition, and then we also have some gender specialists involved from North Carolina A&T. So just want to acknowledge our team, a great team. Um, it's been wonderful working with these people. So t sustainable intensification is so two key words that are part of this, and, and I'm sure you are familiar with this, but just to recap on, on this, defined by uh, Dr. Jules Pretty, uh, who some people regard as, as uh, almost a guru in terms of sustainable int intensification, is defined, so sustainable intensification is defined as producing more output from the same area of land while reducing the negative environmental impacts and at the same time increasing contributions to the natural capital and the flow of environmental services. So in intensification related to productivity, improved nutrition, economics, e economic benefits, but on the sustainable sides, aside looking at the environmental impact, reducing drudgery and addressing water and energy needs. So our overall goal for the consortium is, as you will see here, assessing, developing, adapting, implementing, promoting appropriate scale ag mechanization for sustainable intensification and focusing on smallholder farming systems that are connected with, with Feed the Future countries and particular geographical regions. And a very important part of it there's, uh, then is enhancing the participation and experience of women in the ad adaptation and adoption of the technologies for agricultural development. The countries that we are targeting um, are um, two in Asia, Bangladesh and Cambodia, and in Africa is Burkina Faso and Ethiopia. And in each case, we have connected with a university, um, and we are, as you will see, they're targeting specific uh, value chains. In uh, Bangladesh and Cambodia, rice is important. In Africa, it's maize and livestock. Livestock, somewhat driven by the fact that 
livestock is used for animal power, there for, for performing the operations in the field. But a very important one, as you will see there, for Cambodia and Ethiopia is vegetables, so a cross link from the continents on the vegetable side. And then, of course, in each case, uh, specific regions that we're involved in. So the approach that we are following is we want to develop multifunctional and modular technologies and machinery that are versatile, that are affordable, of course, scalable, and they reduce the drudgery of operations, especially for women. We are focusing on smallholder on-farm tasks that I've already mentioned. Um, we want to build in-country capacity. That's an important part of our efforts. We want to integrate gender considerations. We also want to make sure that we have um, measurable outcomes and impacts. And an important part of this is developing knowledge for the relevant stakeholders in each country and facilitating the creation of business ventures. We see the business um, dimension being very important for our efforts. A big part of this is overcoming existing barriers to the adoption of mechanization. And as I mentioned, we want to build in-country um, in capacity, and we're doing this through what we call innovation hubs that I'll talk a bit about just more just now. So this, again, the overall objectives, de developing an actionable strategy that uh, identifies high priority mechanization subjects, uh, subject areas in each country. We want to gain insights into what the stakeholders regard as being important moving in addressing the quality of life and the livelihood of smallholder farmers in each country in a sustainable way. We want to explore and build synergy and partnerships with the stakeholders and the practitioners on the ground there um, that involve the, the smallholder farmers and identify and assemble resources that can help us advance our goals there. So key questions that we, we have attempted to address in each country uh, what are the critical mechanization needs relative to each value chain? What are the top challenges for meeting each of the, these needs? What are the specific mechanization opportunities that, that we could potentially address? Uh, what are the top opportunities that are, are going to have high impact subject to the availability of resources? And then what tasks should we be addressing um, and who should lead those and who will be the partners um, uh, within each country? And, so we have gone through a process of addressing all of these within each country with the stakeholders. So this then brings me to talking about our strategies for engagement. We've really highlighted or, or emphasized a need for a user-centric engagement or a farmer-centric engagement process that I'll talk about. We also see the importance of a systems approach that I'll talk about some more. And one of the dilemmas that we, we face is, you know, do we you know, look at sort of incremental type technologies or do we try and um, illustrate some potentially disruptive technologies that can you know, really uh, make a big difference? Um, how do we evaluate these technologies to ensure that they are uh, doing what they should be? And then of course, a big part of it is how do we scale up and out in an effective way? So I'll, I'll talk about each one of these. So first of all, the user-centric approach that we followed. So we've um, established innovation hubs in each country um, through the universities that we've connected with. And the purpose of these innovation hubs is to provide the means of networking with all the stakeholders that includes the farmers, of course, extension agents, the universities themselves, entrepreneurs, government agencies and representatives, and then also non-government agencies. And, and we want to then provide a common purpose of being able to support the sustainable intensification and be able to, with, their, with the input of the stakeholders, identify and develop um, the technologies um, that are needed. Coupled with that, we see also the need to have field hubs. So out in the, the communities, the rural community, have field hubs where we can then engage directly with the local farming communities, where we, we also will include farmers, uh, the women, of course, and the youth. Uh, we see, you know, it's incredibly important to, to engage the youth as much as possible because, you know, five, ten years' time, they are the ones that really could make a big difference. And so part of it is facilitating on-site training through these field hubs, being able to demonstrate equipment, 
demonstrate different agronomic practices that can make a big difference as well. And so that, that's the, the, what we would try to achieve with the field hubs. So coming back to the country engagement, um, I think a very important strategy that we followed then, we've held workshops in each country where we then have connected with the local stakeholders. We've had the local stakeholders themselves um, address the, what they believe are the challenges, the top opportunities for interventions. Um, so really providing them with the ownership of uh, what they regard as, as being important in moving forward and what should be addressed in each country. We also have um, ha held field visits where we've been able to um, actually connect and visit the farmers themselves, get some feedback directly from the farmers regarding what they envisage as being the, the, the key issues that they are trying to address um, and you know how, how that corresponds to what the stakeholders will have um, information that they would have provided through the workshops. And, and so that was a, a very valuable, um, um, provide us a very valuable insight into the activities and the needs of these farmers. So just to recap on the visits, so for instance in Cambodia, just to give you a sense of where we went or where the key areas are, Phnom Penh of course, uh, the Royal University of Agriculture is our key partner there, located in the capital there of uh, Cambodia. But in the rural areas, Siem Reap is very important and Batambang, uh, there's a University of Batambang that we've connected with as well. And, and these are, are key locations, but also in the rural areas, um, there are technology parks being developed that, that allow us to have opportunities to connect with the local communities. Um, so just some pictures to show you there of us being out in the rural areas and also in our um, uh, workshop as well. For Bangladesh, um, the, our connection is with the Bangladesh Agricultural University in Maiman Singh, um, but we have uh, other agencies that are um, of importance in the capital, Dakar, um, and then also in the southern region, and then also in the northern region where the Bangladesh Agricultural Research Institute is located, and the Bangladesh Re Rice Research Institute is located. I'm um, sorry. Um, just some more pictures about visits out in the rural communities and, and also from the, the workshop where we, and you can see there in the rural community, even connecting with the women um, entrepreneur, the farmers themselves was, was uh, very, very worthwhile. In Burkina Faso, um, uh, Ouagadougou, of course, is the capital and we have connections there with the USAID mission or the embassy, I should say. Um, we are connected with the Polytech University of Bobo Dalaso. Um, that's, that's our sort of main connection there and where we held the workshop. Our um, field hub is located at a farm in Cumbia, uh, a person we call Mr. Lai, and um, we are very, um, very active there on that farm. Um, you will see some pictures actually from the farm in the top left part and then also pictures from our workshop. We had 80 participants in that workshop with I think um, 20, 20, 20 women, which was fantastic. Uh, Ethiopia, uh, we are connected with Bahida University at Bahida, which is in sort of up north um, there on the edge of Lake Tana. And uh, we visited there, of course, Addis Ababa is where the mission is located. And Simit is, uh, is a, uh, some group that we have connected with. And then also we have had field visits near Bahida as well. Um, pictures there. Um, again, going into the community there was, was really interesting and seeing a lot of things on the ground there. And of course, our workshop uh, went very well too. So I want to talk about the systems approach. Um, we see this as actually critical in terms of being effective in the work that we do, that we do adopt a systems approach. We think about the overall system in these value chains and not just individual components. And I think this has been borne out by many people that have had experience related to this kind of work that, that you do need to think about the overall system and, and the consequences of changes that you might make in within the system that affect the overall system. So we've really emphasized that in our work. And thinking about the system, I mean, there are a lot of factors that come into play. So not just the, the, the sort of technology aspect where we think about the production aspects, the storage and processing, distribution and marketing, 
but when you know the economic aspects you know how do we deal with market access uh, credit availability uh, business opportunities and then on the social side you know culture and traditions are important um, dealing with gender equity issues urbanization maybe uh, providing extension services and then the training aspects as well and then the environment is very important um, addressing soil health availability of water uh, climate change resiliency um, availability of energy and so on so resource management so we see there are a lot of factors that come into play as we we, we go through this then coming to the the issue of technologies and and the introduction of technology so we, we think about well you can go from human power to animal power to maybe mechanization um, engine power and and you know each uh, each of those has its um, sort of potential benefits. So here is just showing an example with um, with animal power in Africa, where we may think about making changes to the the implements that are are used there with the animal power. Um, I'll talk about that some more. Or should we introduce or think about um, being able to provide a single axle tractor or even a two axle tractor to make a, a big difference to to productivity. So as an example, in, in Burkina Faso, we Tillers International have held workshops there with the farmers and helped them redesign the yokes to make them much more ergonomic and, and, and much more comfortable for the for the, the oxen to be able to uh, pull the implements. And then even um, beyond that, training the oxen earlier to make them much more maneuverable in the field um, to increase productivity. I mean, and sort of measures that can really improve uh, the productivity a great deal and and the effectiveness of the of the animals and the and the use of the equipment i just now want to turn to you know the evaluation process so how do we go about actually evaluating these technologies and as an example i'm, I'm going to focus on hand tools but this could be applied to actually any technologies that that may be considered and introduced into a country so here's a, a sort of a, a, um, a listing um, of potential um, evaluations that one could, should think about. First of all, human factors in ergonomics, and I'll come back to this, uh, each one of these in more detail. Safety, of course, very important. Effectiveness of the tool, um, the impact on sustainable intensification, of course, very important, and economic factors. So let me go into these each in a little bit more detail. So first of all, human factors in ergonomics. How easy is it to use the hand tool? How easy is it, is it for women to use the hand tool? Um, is any training required? Um, from in terms of the hand tool um, dimensions and design, um, you know things like the handle diameter. Research has been done to show that you know the ideal diameter is about 30 millimeters or about an inch and a quarter in size. What about the posture in using the hand tool? Is there a lot of bending involved in using the tool, or can we alleviate the amount of bending? And then safety, is there some discomfort in using the tool, or even injury in the worst case? What kind of discomfort, what kind of injuries? Then as far as the effectiveness of the tool, um, is it reliable, does it break down? Uh, how much maintenance is needed? How much, um, is there available parts for it? Um, are they easy to, to fabricate? And on the performance side, um, how, how does it increase the work rate? Um, how much energy is needed to, to actually perform that or use that technology? Um, how does it affect the quality of the work? And you know, in each one of these, you know, a lower level is you know, what kind of metrics might be associated with each of these um, to, to, to determine their effectiveness. On the economic side, um, the costs, of course, are very important, fixed operating costs, um, how, what is the life of the tool? How often does it need to be replaced? Uh, how easy is it to manufacture? What, what is involved in the manufacturing? Uh, you know, maybe with local manufacture, local artisans that could manufacture the, the, the tool. What about scaling up and out? If we now want to have it more broadly used in a region, what is involved with that? Um, looking at maybe the, the financial aspects of the, the, the uh, business aspects of it. Um, how, how can we finance that? What is the return on investment for this? And then, you know, the impacts on households for families, you know, the time, maybe redistribution of 
how the families use their time. And then as far as sustainable intensification is concerned, the environment, of course, is very important. How does it impact soil health? How does it impact the availability of water or the, the efficiency of the use of the water? And what about climate change um, impacts, carbon, monoxide, carbon dioxide emissions or other factors related to resiliency with climate uh, change? And then on the socioeconomic side, you know, how much time is required for this, how much labor is required for this. So th those are sort of, sort of key factors or, or technology evaluation factors that may be considered. And again, I emphasize that at the bottom level, there needs to be some metrics that are associated with each of these. Then scaling up and out. Um, part of this is, you know, the, the creating a, a business model around the equipment. And we see this as a very important for the sustainability of these technologies. Some examples of how this can be done, maybe through local custom hire services or farmer cooperatives or associations that can, as a group, be together and be able to, to um, purchase the equipment and then be able to deploy it in, in the region there. Another important part of this is the indicator framework or the metrics that we might use to show the impact of what we're doing. So productivity, you know, the, the redesign of the yoke, how does that improve the, um, the working of the animals and the comfort of the animals and the productivity of the animals? Environment, how, in terms of different cropping systems um, that, that we could introduce, for instance, in Cambodia, motorbike mounted broadcaster for rice, it can then broadcast rice over existing uh, cropping systems. Economics, um, in Bangladesh with custom hire services that we're exploring. In Ethiopia and Cambodia with vegetables, um, in terms of the human condition that might impact on nutrition, for instance, and vegetables lend themselves to improving nutrition. And then also, of course, participation of women in that. And again, on the social side, you know, looking at self-help groups, for instance, with women, pharma collectives that, that can impact that uh, uh, sort of um, indicator. Just, just if, with the last few minutes, looking at particular cases in Burkina Faso, um, you know, there we, we are looking at both crop and livestock systems and how we can improve the profitability there. Just a, a spec there, you know, manual power is 70% there draft men, uh, animals only about 25% and then a very small percentage of tractors are used there. Opportunities for mechanization, high priorities there are seen as land preparation, planting, weed control, and then water use and conservation as well. And there you can see some pictures showing the, the um, issue of the manual labor for planting and that, that is currently in the situation. Um, as far as particular projects are concerned, I already mentioned about the redesign of the ox yoke to improve the, uh, um, the productivity of animals, um, training the oxen. On the land preparation side, we are, we are involved, looking at a conservation, a redesign or conservation uh, no zone till, tillage ripper. With the planting side, um, we're looking at a development of ox drawn planters with relatively low cost seed plate driven mechanisms, um, with weed control, redesigning cultivators for, for that. Um, we have established a five acre demonstration site for comparing conservation tillage and mechanical planting to current uh, conventional systems. And I thought this, this uh, quote from one of our team members was pretty good, but here in Africa, and especially in Burkina Faso, nothing has benefited us more than agriculture. So we live mainly from agriculture. In uh, Burkina Faso, some, some further pictures showing some of the equipment there um, that there is in place uh, or being experimented with or developed um, in terms of cultivators, rippers, planters, and so on. In Ethiopia, we are um, in the process of um, introducing solar powered pumps for water. It's called the Magi pump that doesn't, actually doesn't require a battery. Then we also have ox driven planters that we are looking at, um, forage choppers for feeding the livestock, uh, maize shellers as well, the development of maize shellers. And just for, for interest in Bangladesh, rice 
plant transplanters, rice reapers, um, higher tech um, combine harvesters, and on the water side, axial flow pumps. And then Cambodia, um, there we're using somewhat more tractor power, single axle tractor power and, and, and two axle tractor power, targeting um, cedars for rice, um, and then even a motorcycle uh, mounted broadcaster there, as you can see, and um, also a crimper to help with, um, with cover crops and dealing with uh, those there in the field. So I'm going to end off with just a final few comments. Um, we see that the, the strategies for engagement that we've now been implementing are, are actually vital for the long-term sustainability of mechanization interventions. So our innovation hubs and our field hubs play a very big role in, in helping us be effective. We see the systems approach also being critical in terms of the long-term success of the project and, and identifying and accounting for all the different components of the system. And as it has been quoted there, systems make it possible, but people make it happen. And emphasizing the business aspect, so the World Food Prize Laureate for 2017 emphasized that farming needs to be a business. And, and this laureate is actually from Nigeria. And then finally, um, you know, we're seeing the value of relying on a team with a broad amount of experience that is able to address a whole range of challenges beyond just the basic technology, such as the women empowerment through our gender specialists and um, you know, the economics aspect um, and the economic practices, animal nutrition all come into play. So having a team like this has been um, you know, very important and very beneficial. And I will then end off with there and just provide our contact details for people, but uh, look forward to any questions from the, the audience. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hansen. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and start doing questions now. So um, the first question is, you guys did a lot of uh, stakeholder meetings and talking with farmers. Is there data available from all the uh, those interactions you had with farmers on what their priorities were in different countries? Absolutely. Yeah. So we have um, very uh, a lot of documentation for, from each of the workshops that we held in each country. We we documented very carefully all the input from the different stakeholders. You know, of course, especially the farmers. So we we do have all that information actually for for each one of the countries. Um, and yeah, so that, that is available. And how would some so some, would somebody just email you to get that or? Yes, yeah, we, we would be happy to provide that that deta those details to anybody that that would like to have them. And and the details you you know the contact information here hopefully, you know either um, Tim um, you know our project manager maybe he would be a, a good starting point, but I'd also be happy to help there. Okay, and your innovation hubs, is that an actual physical space? Um, yes, you could regard it that way. So at, at, within each university, you know, we, we have um, directors um, identified and personnel ident identified associated with that innovation hub. And, and those folks then have, have some um, physical space um, assigned for the project. Um, even um, a workshop um, at within each university um, is is um, has been sort of set up to facilitate the the you know the um, sort of building fabrication testing designing of potential equipment that could then be um, deployed out into the to the field hubs. Um, so there, there is so we obviously rely you know quite strongly on those. On, our, on those universities in terms of providing those uh, resources um, and those uh, physical resources, but, but they, are, they do exist. Okay, and there's a question, is there any sustainability strategy for the mechanization work apart from working with local universities in the country? Well, so in terms of the stakeholders, you know, we, we, we have, you know, government representation, um, we have um, non-government um, participation, different institutes that obviously 
uh, we can leverage their expertise as well. Uh, we even have some um, participation of, of uh, businesses as well that that um, can then you know have, make a big difference. You know, if we can then you know emphasize the business angle, and for instance, in, in bringing in uh, equipment from outside the country um, to to make a difference there. So we we definitely um, have means of of networking with with different stakeholders in each country. Um, and you know that's very important. We say that is a very important function. We rely somewhat on the our the our university contacts to to facilitate that and maintain that, but but that is an important part of the the effort as well is making these connections with um, outside different organisations within the country, including okay. the government. <laughs> and someone asks, are you looking at lessons from small 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 scale agriculture in Europe and America? There are lots of technologies available, even from Amish farming practices. Absolutely. So. Um, the Tillis International, the, the um, NGO that we work with very closely, they, they already are very active in uh, working with the Amish community. And so the technologies that, that they have been introducing, I guess, are, are in some way um, um, emphasized or, or created, developed here in the U.S. through interactions with the, with the Amish community. So it, it, that has been a very important part. Also, um, you know, thinking about lessons learned or, or the what's been done here in terms of technologies. Of course, in the IT side, you know, there are there are huge potential there, for, especially from a capacity building standpoint. But from a, a data collection standpoint, and then you know, even down the track with uh, sort of um, planning for for operations, you know, weather forecasting, uh, making decisions, you know, for the local farmers to be able to make informed decisions about what their activities you know we could see and we already this is happening you know being able to deploy some IT there that can can be of benefit because it's interesting you know when we were in Ethiopia um, and and we we met with a whole bunch of farmers you know over a hundred farmers there in Ethiopia at, at a location we were able to interact with them and one of my questions was, well how many of you how many of you got cell phones and 75% of the farmers had cell phones. And so you can already see, you know, the potential for leveraging that kind of technology to, to then introduce, you know, applications or, or information that could be of value for those local communities. Um, somebody would like to know if you always need assessments to begin each project or can you just enter a project with technologies already identified? Well, so that's a good question. We believe that it's important to to perform an assessment first. Um, you know, there's always the issue of a sort of push-pull kind of dynamic. You want you want a very strong pull, okay? So in other words, in in those local communities, um, you know, you need to assess what what they perceive as the the challenges that they're having. What are the what do they see as the opportunities as well? But they may not have the, you know, the awareness of potential technologies that could be introduced that could have an impact. So that's where the, pu the push comes from. And that's where, you know, with our, our field hubs, we would want to be able to demonstrate different technologies there and practices that they may not be aware of that they could make a difference. But ultimately, they are the ones that need to make the choice. They have to choose. We, we cannot impose. Um, you know, these onto them. We, we can demonstrate them, but they ultimately need to make the choice to make it effective in the long run. Okay, I, have two we oh, go ahead. I have two questions that are kind of um, related to each other. Uh, when you look at something like tillage systems, say in Ethiopia, what are the business models that surround the equipment, say plows, discs, or planters? Who buys them and how are services provided? And then a related question is, can you elaborate more on how and to what extent you have been able to enhance entrepreneurship and business development in Ethiopia with respect to mechanization? Well, <clears throat> so with Ethiopia, um, yeah, it's it's been a, um, an interesting um, interaction with them. And um, as far as, for instance, the, the tillage side is concerned, we are 
sort of still exploring sort of early on some uh, potential um, new technologies there. You know, one of the so one of the things that is happening there is that within the university system, for instance, they um, are uh, uh, we're, we're having you know with capacity building, we obviously want to engage students in in the activities, and so we've had students actually um, themselves designing and testing potential equipment there. But there's the sense that you know there are potentially other technologies outside that already. That, that that are relatively well developed that that could you know play an important role there. So, how do we how do we actually you know encourage them to think about importing or bringing in those uh, sort of different technologies that have been developed elsewhere that that could be a good fit for for them there in in Ethiopia, and and so this is this is a is a, a you know, a continuing maybe a challenge, but an opportunity I think, where we would we would like to facilitate, you know, the 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 introduction or the the, the provision of this of these technologies that may come from outside the country, um, but then you need to have the mechanism of being able to import those technologies. You need to have the the support of the government um, in order to to bring in those potential technologies that that could be made use of in in those areas, so so that's partly where then the connection with the entrepreneurship comes into play. Is you know if if companies could see well you know if I if I bring in this this equipment and this could be very attractive for the farming community, you know I could then convert this into a a viable business venture um, that that could make a difference. So so our challenge or opportunity is then how do we facilitate you know that process of of um, exposing and or bringing in these different technologies uh, that can make a difference but also part of it is of course exploring the the develop local development of equipment as well or, or technologies uh, local manufacturer as well that that can make a difference so so there are quite a few different avenues that this can can take um, that that we, we should really or we need to be exploring uh, I don't know. Hopefully, that answers the question to some degree. So, on uh, I think also the one of the questioners wanted to know: Is there a, do you work with people who are going to do service provision, or what kind of model is the technology usually delivered to the farmer? Yeah. So we, um, for instance, um, in terms of service, we we have um, interacted, for instance, with um, extension um, agencies. Uh, which who obviously connect with the farmers directly and, and provide some training, uh, but also provide a service, so to speak, uh, in terms of, of um, informing farmers about um, you know, improved um, agronomic practices and, and what technologies could be used. Um, but also from the, the custom hire service side, um, we have seen that, that there are some there are some organizations already involved with that or some some groups farming groups cooperatives association farm associations that 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 are already exploring that and we can you know facilitate that further um, but then also um, actually interestingly enough in uh, Cambodia um, and and uh, yeah in Bangladesh as well there are, are businesses that are already somewhat active in bringing um, importing equipment and that that want to obviously expand their 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 um, their zone of influence and, and marketing and that um, that would be um, you know wanting to to expand their um, their, their their businesses and, and and be able to provide services as well uh, to the the farmers um, and then the NGOs of course themselves obviously are are very active in the institution institutes. Uh, themselves are very active in, in connecting with the farmers and providing services um, that can range from you know the technologies themselves to looking at the, the agronomic practices um, crop pr production and that kind of thing um, so uh, somebody also brought up then since you mentioned that um, do we do you think there's enough private sector uh, interaction with your group uh, because that we because of the need to have private sector driving change. 
Um, I think probably the simple answer is no. <laughs> mm -hmm. That that there could definitely be in you know, a lot more private sector involvement. And I think it's very important to have that private sector involvement too. But part of it is then identifying those those potential um, um, organisations in the private sector um, or companies that would have an interest in 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 being involved, you know, with this. Um, and we would then have to rely somewhat in, in terms of our, our uh, local stakeholders in identifying who those folks could be um, in the, the private sector segment of the, um, the, 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 um, company, the, the companies there. Okay, and let me see what are the questions. Um, do you have any uh, ideas of how much hectares of have are involved in have been uh, converted re converted to mechanization that you've brought in? Oh yeah. <clears throat> well, so we've been going for about two years now. Um, I would say yeah the 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 our sort of zone or influence or how many hectares is relatively small at this stage. So we have these uh, field hubs and, and, the, um, and these farms. And uh, I mentioned in, in one of the earlier slides that there is a sort of, I think was it a five hectare kind of uh, block of land that that's been um, already set aside and already um, demonstration plots have been set up on that block of land um, to, to be able to show different uh, practices, the use of different technologies. Um, in the other countries, um, it's probably, you know, at this stage, probably similar amounts of land. But, you know, then this is the very big issue of, you know, the scaling up and out that, that we obviously see as very important. While we may start off with these relatively small um, different demonstration plots, um, we would hope to connect with, you know, a large portion of the, the farming community, at least in the vicinity of the field hub, hubs that could then observe and see and benefit from what is shown at the field hubs to then implement that on their own farms. And, and I should, I, one thing I should have mentioned earlier is that we've conducted um, a baseline survey um, in all four countries, um, which has involved you know, quite a lot of households in the, the rural community to, to establish um, you know, what, is, what is the current status of mechanization, um, economics, um, participation, you know, from a gender standpoint, all the, you know, a whole range of different uh, sort of metrics that that are important relative to our efforts. Because we will then, you know, perform another survey at the end of our um, four years to, you know, to see the relative um, adoption that hopefully may have taken place as a result of our efforts. Um, but, but it's, you know, I think we see this as a long-term kind of effort, you know, it, it goes beyond just four years. Four years is actually a short amount of time to really, you know, get the ball rolling. We've already seen, you know, in terms of the two years that we've been active, you know, that things are moving along very nicely, but it takes time, you know, it really takes time to, to really um, make a, an impact. But you know, we're really determined that, that it will happen and, um, and it, we're already seeing evidence of this and, and we're really excited actually about, about the activities so far that, that have been taking place. So we like to think that we are confident that we, that we can expand the, the, our, our um, activities um, so that they can make a difference on a much bigger sort of um, land area in, in each country. So the next question is, would you agree that the adoption of mechanization, tractors and tillers, is slowly increasing in Africa, sub-Saharan Africa? If so, what will you consider as the key determinants of increasing tractor use? And lastly, the development of tractor rental markets in Tanzania seems to be increasing at a fast rate. How do you see the enabling environment for persistent growth in these rental markets and what barriers exist? Um, <clears throat> Yeah, so um, like I mentioned, you know, in terms of technology, especially in Africa and the, the two countries we've worked in, you know, we the baseline there with the, the power is, is, you know, animals and, and humans for that matter. So if we, in terms of now introducing, you know, like 
uh, tractors of some form or another. That, that is a, a very large, a very big sort of uh, jump in terms of technologies um, that, that can make a big difference in terms of productivity for sure. But then, um, you know, there, it's important to understand and appreciate that to introduce such technologies you have the overheads of the providing the the maintenance the the spare parts repairs and and being able to sustain those technologies those tractors and, and the know-how so in order to to be able to support the introduction of the you know those tractors there has to be the um, underlying support um, and infrastructure to to be able to be able to ensure sort of continuity and sustainability of those technologies and and so that's where it is important that that companies that that would want to do that understand and and I'm sure this happens in Tanzania if they've had their successes there that they, they are doing it considering the importance of providing that um, that sort of networking that dealership or the the provision of that, the maintenance, spare parts, repairs, uh, that kind of thing, and um, in 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 the system as well. Um, so it is it's it's a it's a certainly an, an important consideration for us. Is how do we think about and, and encourage the potential introduction of like tractors or those kinds of technologies that they can make a difference. But there is that overhead of ensuring that there is the, the ability to provide the maintenance, the, the spare parts, um, the know-how for repairs, that kind of thing. Um, so I, I don't know if that, that answer, answers that question uh, as well as it uh, probably should be doing. Okay, one, one more comment someone has. Um, while you, you don't yet, may not have sufficient data to measure your contribution, um, but is there a way of conceptualizing the probable impacts before even starting off with an inter intervention for purposes of enhancing chances of success or greater impacts? Yeah, so that is a very good, good question. And so what we, would, we are doing um, and would continue to do in the future is as you know, with the innovation hubs and the field hubs where we are already um, introducing technologies or developing technologies, uh, being able to test them in the field, so to speak. In that process of testing them, we are evaluating them um, in terms of, of their potential for moving forward. How do they improve productivity? How um, are they in terms of, of improving the crop production aspects of it as well? Um, so, so we we are already conducting measurements in, in to 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 assess those technologies, um, and to and so that that's you know a very important part to so that we can then say well okay if you do if you do introduce this technology, this is the potential impact of improving productivity by you know 10, 20, 30 percent or whatever it might be, but simultaneously in terms of the the crop production, your yield will increase by so much. Um, as well, and and the, as far as the soil health is concerned, we are we are then you know improving the soil health, soil health, the, the the level of nitrogen and whatever constituents in the soil um, by this much as well. So so this is a very important part of what we would we are doing and would do in the future as well, as far as we assess the the impacts and the value of these different uh, technologies. Um, and finally, when you think about research for development, what would be the five technologies that you would hope that someone would move up to scale? Uh, well, well, so obviously these technologies have to be thought of in the context of the different value chains. Um, for instance, in, um, in the needs, you know, the, the relatively local needs. Um, for instance, in, um, let's take, for instance, Burkina Faso. So um, you know, we start at the level of of the the animal power. What kind of interventions can we provide relative to animal power that can make a big difference? And and I already have illustrated some of those that we're implementing with the help of Tillers International, for instance, the redesign of the yoke, the training of the oxen. But coupled with that is the actual implement themselves, implements themselves, 
that they can make a difference. So one of the things that we're looking at is, is a, a ripper system for, for ripping through the soil, um, which has some conservation aspects associated with it. Um, and then a planter um, that, that can be deployed, to, that can be you know, effective in, in um, providing and, and dropping, depositing seeds in the field as it compared to now with, with the, the manual way of doing it. Um, in um, Cambodia, there's a huge need for um, rice um, seeding machines. Um, so this is, you know, it's obviously transplanting is used as well, but uh, direct seeding of rice is seen as a huge need. So um, technologies there that, that can um, actually be planting the seed, which I showed you um, there, uh, a sort of a drill kind of a, a drill kind of mechanism that that we we um, that the, the folks in Cambodia are already experimenting with. Um, on the water side in in Ethiopia, a big a big factor is the extraction of water out of the wells. You know the means of doing that, and that can also impact on irrigation. And so the, the I mentioned about the Magi pump that we're introducing there. The magic pump was actually developed here at the University of Illinois by a person, uh, Dr. Lilly. And, and so we are already deploying uh, a number of those in Ethiopia that could make a huge difference in terms of the extraction of water um, out of wells there in Ethiopia. So, so those are just a, a few examples of technologies that we're already seeing that could you know, have a big impact. Okay, I think um, it's almost 10 o'clock, so we're going to wrap up now. So I just want to remind everybody, uh, well, first let me thank Dr. Hansen for his uh, presentation. It was greatly appreciated. Thank you. Thank you for the yeah. opportunity. Mm -hmm. And I want to remind everybody that this will be uh, archived at our website, as well as the previous four webinars, um, several of which dealt with uh, some other technologies that are in, available in Africa. Um, and also, again, remind you that there will be one week from today, same time, same place, a webinar on the, the new soybean uh, disease guide that still put out. Now, as we close out, um, there is going to be a survey as you, as you uh, uh, let me see, I need to launch the survey. Oh, boy. Um, Courtney, can you, d do I um, close down and then the survey automatically launches, or how does it work? Um, if it's a poll, you need to launch it now. It's a survey at the end. Oh, yep, then they'll get it when they leave. Okay, so if you guys could all fill out the survey, it's um, kind of related to our last question, which is what would you like uh, to see be a focus of research um, as far as mechanization in Africa goes. So I want to thank you all for attending, and um, we will be going on a brief hiatus, won't have any webinars for a couple months, but we hope to start again in the winter. And if any of you have um, subjects or projects that you would like to discuss, please get hold of me. So again, thank you to everybody. Yeah. So, yeah. All right. Well, thank you. Is that is that okay?